we are doing dot on top of dot printing. This may be the most technical process you have ever encountered. If you are not able to dial in your press, your print is going to look blurry. So my goal here today is to show you what those separations and what they look like on screen, what they're gonna look like when they're actually printed because there's always some shift in one way or another until you have built up enough of an understanding, enough of a history of printing where you understand more about what the colors are going to do once they're on the shirt itself, once they're printed over a white base. You are start, gonna start to learn and categorize in your head, kick a cat, catalog it, all the interactions of your mixing system and how colors are built and how that looks once it's printed. It sounds really deep, it sounds really convoluted, and in a way it is, yes. Um, but these are all things that you are going to need to learn and start to understand as you progress through the world of doing sim process, creating your own separations, and getting better and better at what you do. So when you're doing sim process, it's very important to make sure that your platen is very clean and very smooth. If you have any texture on your platen, it's gonna show up in your print, and it's going to affect how the print looks more than it does if you're just printing a standard spot color design. The quality of your garment is going to affect your print and how smooth it is, how good your color development is. If you are using uh, something that's more like a promo weight garment or a cheaper uh, garment that the surface is a little rougher, your print, even if your skill was, was A tier skill, it's never gonna be as good as if you're printing on a smooth blank. Uh, we're printing on all made 100% cotton black uh, it has a very, very fine surface, so we're gonna get really nice clean prints out of it. So as you saw in the video, this is eight screens. We have our base white, our six colors, and then our highlight white. Print order usually is not super important, but there are general rules to follow, which you can clearly break anytime you need because the design and the print is gonna demand that. So we're gonna go base white, we're gonna flash it, and that's the only flash that we're gonna do. Every other color is going to be a single stroke, and we're gonna finish with the highlight white. So we're printing with Wilflex inks today. We're using Bolt White for both the underbase and our Highlight White and the Rio mixing system for our colors. We'll talk about those colors and what went into making them as we're printing the design. Typically, when you print your underbase, you're gonna two-stroke it. You're gonna do a flood and a print and a flood and a print. It gives you really nice white ink development, but the goal is not to try and make it look like it's 100% solid. If you remember in the video, we were talking about channel solidity, the opacity of that channel. I usually have mine at around a 75%. Yours is gonna be anywhere between 60 and 80. But this is what it ends up looking like. In those areas that are solid, they're not 100% brightness, but it does have good levels of brightness. Your results are going to vary until you have enough practice. So reminder, we're printing through a 230 mesh. This is standard mesh, and we're using a 70 durometer squeegee. Uh, these are sharper squeegees. You could use a 65, 90, 65 squeegee to print your base white. Your mileage will vary. Use the tool that you are most comfortable with. You're always gonna wanna do a flood and a print, and if you're two-stroking, another flood and another print, because we want to pre-fill that stencil so that it's easier for us to get that ink to flow through that higher mesh count and to then deposit cleanly on the shirt. And to recap, the smoothness of your t-shirt is going to dictate how easy it is for that ink to lay down smooth on the fabric. We're gonna flash this, and because the platen's gotten cold, it's gonna take a little bit longer. And we're going to do a flood print on the other six colors and finish with the highlight white. I am using a 70-90-70 durometer squeegee blade. My goal is to lay down just enough ink to cover the shirt, but to control my ink deposit. That's where that 90 
in the middle of the 70 and 70, the 70, 90, 70, that stiff spine on the squeegee is going to help to control how much my squeegee will actually bend. Most of that applied pressure will be on the downforce of the squeegee blade, and then the edge of the squeegee is just shearing that ink across. And you'll watch that in play. All right, nice and dry. Like I said, your print order is not 100% locked in stone. You can switch this around. As a general rule, you want your most opaque inks to be printed first and your most translucent or transparent inks to be printed last, as those inks will layer on top of the darker inks, allowing the color of the ink underneath it to shine through better. During this process, that physical blending, wet on wet, of the dots on the ink is very important as well to get that nice smooth color blend. So this is the 032 red. You can see that I didn't use a typical print stroke for just printing colors where it's, woo, I'm moving my arms all over the place. I'm coming in, I'm holding my arms rigid. I'm using my abdominal muscles to pull myself forward and then I'm stepping backwards. I'll show you again on the blue. Flood, down force, abdominal crunch, and then I'm stepping backwards. My idea, my goal is to keep that at a five, per, uh, five degree angle, maybe 10 from straight up. So if that's straight up, just a little bit of, a, of an angle in order to get a nice clean deposit, but still have enough ink going down on the fabric. And we just continue the process. This is my purple. Before I print my highlight white, I wanna give you a good look at what the, the rich color development is. Cause when you have a highlight white, a lot of the need for that is one, your, your solid white areas, but it's also the controlling of docking and creating pastel shades. So I wanted you to see what it looked like before we're actually printing the highlight white to control all of those areas. Okay. And there it is with the highlight white. You know how it's having trouble getting this to come out and develop properly. The highlight white is coming in and doing exactly what we need it to. It's brightening up some areas. It's creating pastels. As we come into he uh, here, we can see it doing all the control that we need it to. Now, when we run it through the dryer, there are going to be small changes going on. In this case, we're using Wilflex inks and we're using Bolt White for the underlay. All Wilflex whites have a little bit of puff to them. And so we're gonna get a little bit of loft and a little bit brightness of print. And since I'm using that same ink for the highlight, that can also do just a little bit of a puff, which can end up changing how the color looks. We can also see some uh, muting of the colors. Like we may not see perfect blending here, but when it comes out at the end of the dryer, we see a little bit more color development on highlight white. However you're using your inks, whatever inks you're using, your final proof is always going to be at the end of the dryer. What you see here is not perfect yet. It is not the final product. Just like when you're color matching, you don't color match just by looking at the ink in the bucket. You need to do a print to confirm that the ink looks correct. So I'm gonna cure this and then we'll talk about it. So as you can see with that highlight white that I was talking about, it did dull out just a little bit and you saw a little bit of that color come through compared to when it was still wet. So after cure is definitely when you wanna take a look at whether or not the color development of your print looks the way you want it to. 
Next, I want to talk about the little things you need to pay attention to when setting up your press. When you're selecting your screens, you want to choose the screens with the highest tension possible, and you want those screens to all be within one or two newtons of each other, ideally. When you pull your squeegee, if your mesh tensions are quite a bit different, three, four, five newtons different, you can end up seeing mesh distortion. And because we are very focused on dot on top of dot printing, if you get your design to line up in one at the bottom of your design, but it doesn't line up on the top, and in order to get them to, you know, you can never get them to match up, then that, that's not good halftone printing. That's not good dot on dot printing. So it's really important to match up your screen tensions. The next is off contact. When you're pulling your squeegee, you need that screen to snap up off the garment as quickly as possible right behind that squeegee. This is something we talk about across all kinds of printing. It doesn't matter what it is, that screen needs to come off. But it's even more important when we're doing detail printing like this. The longer a screen is in contact with the ink, the more it's gonna disturb that ink layer. It has time to kind of cement to it. And as it comes up, it's gonna, you know, come up as, as and create texture. It's gonna orange peel it. Your detail, your fine dots are gonna turn mushy and muddy. You're going to lose that crispness of dot detail because your screens were too loose. So when you're working with the press with central off contact, like the 300, it's a very easy step to make. All you need to do is adjust this knob in the back so that it comes off of your platen a little bit higher. The other thing that we want to talk about, instead of just you know straight up off contact, is holding the top of your screen rigid so that as you pull your squeegee across, that off contact is even from the back to the front. Now, you're gonna use one of two things. You're either gonna use the neck of your T-shirt to help support that, or we're gonna put a little build up here. Now, whether or not you can use a build up here, usually a coin, uh, it could be a nickel, a quarter, a dime, depends on how cheap or expensive you wanna be today, but that's always gonna to need to fall and touch the platen. Um, in this case, I have this set up where the, the top of the platen is a little bit underneath where the screen is. So I'm using the neck of my T-shirt to help control that off contact. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but it is an assist. If you have a way to set up your press so that you can hold the top of your screen rigid above your platen, you're gonna be in great shape. One of the things I want to address is you've seen me uh, pulling a squeegee and you've noticed that I am a big individual and the pressures that I'm using are typically out of reach of the standard screen printer. One of the things you want to focus on is that hard solid downforce contact with, between your squeegee and your substrate, your t-shirt and, and whatever white base you have. You need to make enough solid contact that when that dot comes through your mesh and hits the shirt, it's just that dot droplet. If you are not using enough pressure, then you end up uh, not printing a complete droplet. You know, you, do not, you don't get a clean print. So having enough solid contact is really important. If you are unable to do so, either getting a step stool, a little box or a carton to stand on so you can get a little more leverage will be important or you can use an easy grip squeegee. Remember, they're not as wide as a 14 or 16 inch full squeegee, so make, keep that in mind when you're doing your prints. But the point of this is that there, you need to have good solid contact with your substrate, your white base, in order to get a nice clean print. You can compensate by doing a second print stroke, but now you have to work harder in your separations to control your dot gain because we're going to be increasing that a lot by two stroking an ink. So I'm gonna show you that again. I'm not going to flood my red this time. I'm just gonna do a single print stroke so we can get a good look at what that looks like. Keep trying to keep my squeegee straight, coming across. So this is what it looks like without a flood print. 
It still looks really good. We have good color development. Uh, we had enough solid ink come down. Part of that is because I have really good solid contact with the substrate. As you can see, depending on how you did your separations, either flooding or not is just fine. It's all gonna depend on how things look and how things print on press. With that said, we still recommend always approaching it from a flood print process. One of the things we really wanna do as screen printers is emulate how an automatic press prints. They will always flood the image area, making it easier for that squeegee to transfer ink from the screen onto the shirt and then controlling the angle on an automatic and then that downward force, that helps you to control that ink deposit in that shear and simulating that is gonna do nothing but help you create a better print. I'm gonna give you a little history of how I got into the industry and why I approach things the way I do. My very first job in screen printing was in a shop that had five automatic presses. So I learned by watching those automatics work the proper flood, the proper angle, the proper pressure, and how that pressure and the squeegee selection made that squeegee bend. When I left that job and I took a job doing manual screen printing, I tried my best to emulate what those machines were doing. And as a result, my prints turned out better than the majority of manual screen printers around me. And they were all confused. How are you doing that? And I'm like, I'm printing how an automatic prints. And so I tried to relay to them everything that is needed to accomplish that goal. Uh, and then I looked in the mirror and realized that I am not a small individual. I'm six foot two, I am not a small person. So emulating a machine is actually easier for me to do. So all I can do to coach you is to watch how a machine works, watch how an automatic press works and try to emulate it as best you can. We are human, we can't do this. We, we can't recreate what that machine can do a thousand times an hour, but we can strive to do that for the better prints. If you find that you cannot do that, then you take the knowledge you've gained from how your print looks on press and you apply that to your Photoshop curves for each color to compensate for what you can get on a t-shirt if you're manually screen printing. If you're on an auto, learn those nuances of what your press can do and then engineer your steps for what your press can do. So as we've been talking about through the entirety of this video, we are reproducing the design. We are doing dot on top of dot printing. This may be the most technical process you have ever encountered. If you are not able to dial in your press, your print is going to look blurry. I'm sorry, but there's nothing you can do about that. Pull out a loop, take a look at how your dots are falling on top of each other. If they are not stacked, it's going to be a little bit blurry. This is definitely going to challenge you and your business. Your separator, whoever's doing the separations, is going to need to up their skill level. Who is ever in your dark room, time to improve your skills. Your printer, Yep, same thing all the way around. The very first time I started to attempt sim process printing, I thought I had stuff dialed in. I thought my screens were amazing. I thought my prints were amazing. My ego was feeling really good. The first time I did this, my ego got battered. It was black and blue. I thought I was good. This process showed me I still had a lot to learn and it reinforced my desire to dive in and dig deeper and learn how to get better at all of these steps and all these processes. I love this. I love reproducing art on t-shirts. I'm glad that I tackled that challenge and that I learned how to, to do all those steps myself. And it's gotten me here today. One of the things that I mentioned that kicked my when I first started to do some process was dialing in my darkroom. I thought I had my EOM under control. I thought I understood exposure times. Um, I thought that I could produce an amazing screen. So when I first saw 55 LPI, I, my jaw dropped a little bit. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, I'm supposed to get all this on a screen, every single last dot. 
I hadn't yet done something at that level. And that was a learning, that was a, that was an experience. That was a, a high learning curve for me. I had to learn to coat my screens thinner. I had to learn to dial in my exposure times for keeping detail. Uh, I needed to make sure that the films I was using, the dot that I was getting on those films actually looked like a dot, you know? At the time, inkjet was brand new. Today, inkjet is the norm, or wax if you have a direct-to-screen, lasers if you're really lucky. So when we start to dive into how, you know, what is the tonal range I can keep? Can I keep a 10% to 5% dot? Can I keep a 5% to 1% dot? It's really important to take a look at your films and how that dot is developed. Remember, an inkjet printer shoots out droplets of ink. It tries to put them in the same spot. This is not always possible. So when you pull out your loop and you look at those 5% to 1% dots, they're not dots, they're dot clusters. So it's very important to understand the tools you have, recognize that we may need to improve the quality of our inkjet printer or learn how to fine tune it uh, to get a better dot cluster that looks more like a dot. And once you have that, getting into the dark room and dialing in those exposure times, dialing in your EOM so that you can resolve as many of your dots as possible becomes very important. And the proof is right here on the shirt. So where I'm going with this is that it's very important to know your tools, learn what you can and can't get out of them, and then compensate for that in your separations. So when you get on press, you know what to expect. When you print a design wet on wet, the very first print you do where you're not flashing any of the colors, you're gonna get ink transfer onto the back of the screen. And this one looks really good right here. You're gonna get ink transfer to the back of the screen. This has to happen, okay? And we need that buildup to be controlled. This is where controlling your squeegee angle, your pressure and the amount of the ink on the garment is partly really, really important. If you're laying down too much ink, of course, you're just gonna get a blurry image, but you're also gonna get ink on the back of the screen that ends up being blurry. So if this ink deposit here is not controlled, then you're just gonna get even more mush. As that screen comes down, touches the ink and comes up, it's just gonna create mush. Every time it hits, everything's gonna spread out and be mushy. If your press is moving around a bit, that's just gonna make it worse. But you want ink on the back of the screens. So you can see that even the red, the very first color down way over there is on the back of this screen. And this is the purple. Let's go over here to the back of this white. The red is there, the yellow is there, both blues, the green, the purple from the screen right before it. Everything is there. Your prints, when the very first time you print, it should look light. It should look more pastel. It should look like you need to apply or print more ink to get make sure that the the design looks good. And that's fine, it's supposed to look like that. If it looks perfect on the very first print, be scared. You need to go back and make adjustments. Continue printing so that you learn and you see what's going on. But as you continue to print, the ink builds up in the back of the screen, your color development happens. Everything becomes even. That first print to the 10th print. Around the seventh to 10th print, everything's gonna even out, everything should start to be stable. That's what you need to get to that's when the print needs to start to look correct. If you find that it's too saturated, meaning it's, it's colors are too much, the blends are too much, maybe it's a little muddy, you've got some orange peel effect going on, time to go back to your separations. Use your curves tool, open up those shadow areas a little bit more. Remember, everything should open up a little bit. That shadow area, you pull that over to that 90 I was talking about, now it doesn't have to be 90, just that open it up, and then everything starts to open up along with it. Go back and play. This is a learning experience. You are probably gonna go through six to a dozen designs before you start to feel comfortable with the whole process. So we've talked about the process of printing through all of this. What we haven't really talked about is your actual ink selection. In order to do this, you need to purchase an ink that is designed to print wet on wet. If you are using an ink that is not designed for wet on wet printing, this ink buildup that you see here on the back of the screen is not going to be wet ink. It is going to be a sticky ink deposit. 
and that sticky ink deposit over, over a certain number of prints. It can be as low as 20, it can be as many as 100. That's gonna slowly build up, and then with each squish, it's gonna be just like a marshmallow. That deposit is gonna to start to spread out, and that's gonna to start to close up parts of your design. You are gonna first notice that as parts of your design start to disappear. And unfortunately, you're gonna end up ruining a few dozen shirts at least because of it before you catch it and clean the back of your screens. It's very important to start with an ink that is designed for wet on wet printing. And there are a lot of inks out there that are not designed for wet on wet printing. Does not matter what your technical skill is, does not matter what your mess, mesh selection is. If the ink is not made for wet on wet printing, it will build up on the back of your screen. For this job, we're running all Will Flex inks. We're using Bolt White for the underbase and the Highlight White, and we're using the real mixing system for the colors. You've already seen how it's performed wet on wet, and there are multiple shops over the last several years that are using this within their processes for wet on wet printing. It is an ink that is proven to work in this scenario. Now we can all agree that this design looks really good right now. Since I've been involved with the art selection, the separation of the, of the art, all the way through the lines, I see all the little flaws in it that I would have wanted, ah, oh, I wanna change this, or oh, I wish I kept a little more detail in my screens. Whatever that case is, I'm the person who sees that. The person that, really, that this really matters to is your customer. If your customer likes it, then you're good to go. You don't need to go and make any more changes. You just need to be stable. Now, if your customer comes to you with art that's marginal, it's kind of fuzzy, maybe it's a really bad JPEG, there's nothing you can do if you are tasked with separating it and then printing it. It's very much a WYSIWYG. What you see is 100% what you get. You cannot pull any more detail than the file already has. We've spoken to this over all the courses. We started with artwork that was vector clean, and then I showed you what happens if you lose, if you convert to a JPEG, if you upsample or downsample, you get fuzzy edges, and you just can't create a good looking separation because of that. If that holds true through the entirety of the process, it doesn't matter if you have the Mona Lisa to separate and your separator does a fantastic job and you get it on press and you just can't hold the detail on your screens or you can't print it correctly. If you don't know how to print, it doesn't matter. With something that is not good quality, your print is going to look like the image was not good quality. There's nothing you can do to change that. WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Garbage in, garbage out. Bottom line, while I've given you all of these suggestions and reinforced ways to print this, to, to separate it, to go through these steps, if you create a print using your own way to get there that looks amazing and your customer is happy with it, you're doing fine. Always put steps in place to make yourself better, to achieve optimal results. But remember, if the customer's happy, you're happy. The bottom line is my skill, my ego is mine. That is not my business. That is not the sale. In very rare instances, it's the sale. But it's about making your customer happy. If you produce a t-shirt with a print that they are ecstatic about and they're gonna wanna come back, you've done your job. It's a win. It wasn't until, for me, probably the 10th print, maybe the 12th, where I started to feel comfortable both in the dark room, in my separations and everything else. Back when I started to learn this, back when I went looking for knowledge, there wasn't much available. This was 99, 2000. You had push button software and printed magazines. The internet was not much of a thing. There was a very specific website. Um, this was the Scott Fresner's website uh, in his chat room in which there was a lot of information being handed out and talked about. And as I was going through trying to figure out how to get better, that was when I discovered that website 
And during my conversations there, that was when the SIM process discussion really started taking off and the free sharing of knowledge at that time and how you could read it, work on it, apply it, learn more, and then share your responses with everybody else. It was a really great opportunity for me to work over time to get better at things, something that I love doing. In this course, I've tried to condense that down into maybe a day or two of viewing instead of having this spaced out over the course of years. All right, now that we've gone through the process of showing you how to print wet on wet, the nuances involved with uh, printing SIM process wet on wet so that you get the best print possible, we have the applied effort of everything that we just did in Photoshop. So what's our next step? We need to take this design and then compare it to the screen, the separations that we did before. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna check our colors. We're gonna look at the dot gain that happened and make sure that that's similar to what we saw on screen. Did we get color shift? If we got color shift, how do we take notes and use that in our future separations? So join us in the next video and we're gonna go through all of that and we're gonna continue your education. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in learning more about color separations, watch our full course on screenprinting.com where we will dive into spot color, color reduction, index, grayscale, and the always popular SIM process.